you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to continue uh, a message that I gave you a couple of weeks ago. And uh, there was, I, di- I did have more to say, but I decided to quit that morning. Sometimes that's what pastors have to do. We don't really finish, we just quit. And, uh, but it was proper to quit at that time. And so I want to return to that theme of, of love and, um, and the importance of it in the body of Christ. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the book of Corinthians is rather amazing. Both letters that Paul wrote. And you hear the term, I'm sure you've heard the term megachurch, super church. And in America today, we tend to elevate, you know, certain ministries above others. And we kind of, you know, aspire um, maybe, uh, or admire, maybe might be more proper the word, admire, you know, what's going on in those churches. And everything looks great, you know, it's a magnificent ministry, and I'm sure in many cases it is. But not everything that looks big and glorious on the outside necessarily is so on the inside. The Corinthian church is probably the first megachurch of the New Testament era. And the reason that we know that is because Paul kind of tells us that. Um, He starts off his first letter to this church that he planted. He helped to establish. He helped to plant this church. And he starts off by saying this in verse 4. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way. Now, does that sound like a church to admire? God has enriched your church in every way. I mean, I would like to be that kind of church, wouldn't you? That God is enriching us in every single way? Wow. He says, with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. And so, you know, this was, this was a, a, a wonderful church. I mean, they were smart. They had, they had a lot of knowledge. And in verse 6 he says, this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now that you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, this was a super dynamic congregation. They were enriched in every way. They had spiritual gifts running out of their ears. They were were awesome. They were powerful. And yet in the midst of all these miraculous gifts, There was absolute madness on the inside. Total madness. They were an absolute wreck of a congregation. Paul goes on in his first letter to them. He says, there are divisions and elitism among you. He covers that in the first four chapters. He says, some of you, you follow Apollos. Some of you follow, you know, another... Some of you follow, you know, me. Some of you follow Christ. And, and they were a divided congregation. So here was this enriched, amazing congregation divided at the core. And he appealed to them to be uni- unified. There was sexual immorality. Even to the degree that Paul says that even the pagans, even those who are non-believers, look upon the church with an odd eye. Like, really? (laughs) The the situation he referred to, he says in chapter 5, he says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. He said, something that even pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. And so here this megachurch of spiritual gifts and being completely enriched, 
were very tolerant of just gross sin. He even says in 1 Corinthians 5, you know, he kind of addresses, you know, today it's very, very popular, and, and I think that some of our theology has swung a little too far in order to make a correction. Um, Christianity, I, I believe, has a history of being a bit legalistic, especially here in America, you know, and it became a, a, a religion of, of rules. And as a way to bring correction to that, uh, we began to bring a more focus on the doctrine of grace. And, and yet, in some circles, the grace theology has swung the whole other side of the pendulum where now we're almost tolerating sin to a degree that we're afraid to even speak about it and even justify it even theologically. Like, well, the Bible says not to judge one another. Do you know that the Bible actually says we are to judge each other? Did you know that? You want me to show you? You want the verses? It's right here. It's in this situation where there was, in the fellowship of the, of the church, there was a man who was having a sexual relationship with his mother-in-law. And Paul is addressing that. In this mega church full of spiritual gifts, this super church, and in verse 9 he says, When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers. I wasn't talking about those outside the church. I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or, or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. Verse 11, I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worship idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the Scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. Now, keep in mind, this was, this was a person who was willfully sinning, and it was being tolerated in the church. And the church body and its leadership in the church of Corinth were accepting of this outward sin. And so there was no truth to really come against it. And Paul says, no, as the body of Christ, one of our, the most loving things that we can do for one another is to approach each other with the truth. And, and yet, today it's very popular to pull out, uh, you're judging me, card, right? I got it right on the back. Hey, stop judging me. And we, we do that as believers. As believers. You know, if someone is, if I am walking in sin, if I, as a matter of fact, you know, we need to be in accountable relationships so that people actually are able. We position ourselves intentionally for people to speak into our life in that way. And so as your pastor, if there's something I am doing that is sinful, wouldn't it make you feel a little safer to know that there's people that are actually speaking into my life? Or would you rather me pull out the judgment card all the time? Hey, don't say that to me. You're judging me. Hey, you're judging me. Stop it. You can't judge me. You would be out of here in a quick minute. At least you should be. Everyone, including pastors, need to be in accountable relationships where if our life is out of line with the will of God, that we have people in our life who are willing to lovingly judge us. And yet, the whole grace theology has, has shifted so far off center, so far. It's, it's erroneous that now we can't even call sin, sin, and we even teach, don't confess sin. And it's wrong. And in the church of Corinth, that's exactly what they were dealing with. Is that people were afraid to even, even talk about sin. And so here was this super church full of spiritual gifts. They were amazing. Paul commends them immensely. And yet there was madness 
In the midst of miracles, there was madness going on. They looked great on the outside, but were a mess on the inside. They were dabbling in idolatry. He goes on to address that. There was chaos in their worship services. I mean, he has to correct them on several different levels of madness. He's like, when y'all come together and you have communion, you look just like a wild party <laughs> happening in the church. He's like, you are, you are desecrating the very thing that Christ said to uphold as sacred. And they were coming together and, you know, they were, rather than, you know, approaching the communion table with, you know, humility and with, with authenticity, they were desecrating it, making it into a potluck meal. That's what the Bible says. Do you know that? Potluck meal is in the Bible. They were treating it like a potluck meal. And so, you know, there was chaos. In the midst of all of this, there was chaos. And then I shared with you the other week, and I just want to remind you again, that in the middle of all this, in the middle of writing these, this letter, Paul points out something very, very important. He says, guys, you can have all the spiritual gifts you want. You can have all the knowledge that you think you have. You can have all the miracles, raising the dead. You can have all that, all you want. But he says in 1 Corinthians 13, if you have not love, you have nothing. And so is it possible to look super spiritual on the outside and have no love on the inside? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. I think Paul loved the Corinthian church. He planted it. And he was speaking these truths because he so loved them. He loved them. Love. Our goal as a body of believers here in this church, I can at least say for us, can't speak for anyone else, is not to be the most spiritual church in town not to be the most gifted. But one thing we want to be known as as a loving church. A place that is deeply in love with God and not afraid to be deeply in love with each other. If the Corinthians church would have taken their eyes off of trying to be too spiritual and set their eyes on God and set their eyes on each other, they could have cleaned up this mess very easily. Turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 10 just to further illustrate this for us and help us kind of make it practical this morning. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. I'm sure many of you have heard this story many times. Some of you, maybe this will be the first time. But Luke 38 a wonderful story. It's a word picture. It's something that happened, but it's, but it's a wonderful word picture for us this morning to get a hold of what it means to love as the body of Christ. In verse 38 says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. And she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Verse 41. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. And Mary, she has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. I think here is a word picture of two churches represented by Mary and Martha, both of whom have in the center of the home Jesus Christ. And there are two different ways to respond to his presence in the house. One is to be in a frenzy 
to try and do everything they can to do all the right stuff, to be busied with work, and yet never get near the master who is in the house. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world. And Martha is a picture of the church who is completely dependent on getting near the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that Martha and her response is not all wrong? Nor is Mary's response all wrong. I think what the Lord is trying to correct in this, in, in this situation is that whatever we do for the Lord, whatever spiritual gifts we exercise in the body of Christ, whatever we do for God must come out of our time of being with God. Martha's mistake is that she didn't take time to be with Him first. Not because she was doing something. Jesus didn't rebuke her for washing the dishes. Jesus didn't rebuke her for cleaning the house. What he rebuked her for was not taking the time to just simply be with him. Be with him. Now I'm sure that when Mary got up from being with the Lord, she began to do something. I don't know what she did. And and so that's the other part. There's other things in the scripture that we could pull from this morning, but I think the Lord would also say to Mary, well, Mary, it's good that you've been here for the last 12 hours, but now it's kind of time to go do something. Okay? (laughs) Go along. Jesus said, go into all the world and spread the good news. He didn't say, lay here until I come back and just hang out and, and cry at my feet. He said, no, come here and gain your strength. Come here and gain your purpose. Come here and gain your focus. Come here and and experience the love of God so that you have something to go and give away. And so here's the picture of the church. A church that is willing to love at the feet of Jesus so that it can love one another. Amen? Amen. Don't allow your doing to trump your being. The church today is full of Martha's and Mary's. We're living in the same place, but they also represent two different attitudes toward the Lord and toward the body of Christ. Martha's spirit says, let's get things done. Mary's spirit says, let's get together. And again, both are relevant. But the balance must be struck when our doing for the Lord flows out of our being with the Lord. That is the balance. Our doing for Him must flow out of our being with Him. So how do we love? I love the, the story of when Jesus and Peter met up after his death and Jesus came back and spent time with his disciples. And, and one day Peter, uh, Jesus looked at Peter in the eye and he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, absolutely, Lord, I love you. You the man. You are The man. I mean, I saw them kill you on a cross. I saw them put you in a grave and here you stand before me. Jesus, you are the man. And Jesus turned to him and said, there's a little bit of interpretation there. He didn't kind of color the story a little bit. But then Jesus looked him in the eyeballs again and said, Peter, 
do you really love me? Do you love me? And Peter was like, Lord, how many times do I need to tell you this? I answered you the first time. I mean, has this death thing kind of taken your hearing away? Of course I love you. You, sir, are the man. And then a third time, Jesus looks him in the eyeballs and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter was insulted. Third time, Lord, I don't know what to tell you now. I've got nothing left. And Jesus goes on to tell him, he said, Peter, I, what I, what I want to know is are you willing to lay down your life for me? Now, for all the Bible scholars in the house, you may know the significance of that story when you interpret the word love in that exchange of the conversation between Jesus and Peter. The first time when, Pe when Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I am, I phileo you. Phileo is a Greek term where we get the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. The city of brotherly love. And so Peter says, Jesus, well, of course, you're my brother. We're brothers. And, and Jesus was not using the word when he said, Peter, do you love me? He wasn't saying, Peter, are you my brother? Peter, are we friends? Hey, are we, are we tight? Jesus was using the term, the Greek term agape. So Jesus was saying, Peter, do you agape mean? And Peter was saying, Jesus, I phileo you. You're my friend. We're brothers. Jesus is like, Peter, listen to what I'm saying. Do you agape mean? Jesus, look, I said we were friends. We're always going to be friends. See, the word agape means not just friendship. Agape in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of God, means are you willing to love me to the end? Are you willing to love me when love doesn't become convenient? For either of us. You say we live in this mentality in our world today that everything is convenient. Everything's throwaway, including relationships. Huh? Yeah. Sure, we can hang out, we can be friends. I mean, look, I have Facebook, I enjoy social media with limits. But I can tell you that the 1,500 people that are on my friend list on Facebook are not agape relationships. Okay? They're friendships, acquaintances. But there are people right here in this congregation and some others who are outside this congregation who are agape relationships. That we will go to the wall for each other. They're not convenient. As a matter of fact, giving up on our relationship is not an option. One of those relationships is right here. And let me tell you, it's not always convenient for her to be married to me. And yet, we live in a world that says, look, when it no longer becomes convenient. It's okay. Check out. The body of Christ is not about convenient relationships. It's about covenant relationships. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't say, hey, uh, in case y'all need anything, 
I hung up here for you. Just let me know if you ever need anything. What Jesus did on the cross was to enter into a covenant relationship that is bound by his blood. He sealed it with his blood. Amen? Sealed it. What the Corinthian church didn't realize was how to live in this covenant kind of love. You see, a covenant kind of love would have taken a man who's having an affair, a sexual affair with his mother-in-law, would have taken him aside and said, Brother, let me open the scriptures up to you because what's going on right now, that's called sin. And so we're going to walk with you, okay? We're going to hang out with you. And we're going to help you to deal with this issue in your life. But rather, they were like, well, no, let's just kind of, it's better for us to just hang out. It's better for us to fill the church with a lot of people. Who cares? (laughs) But God, He cares. He wants us to walk in love, in agape love. Love. Is that what you have with him? See, that's what he has for you. He agapes you. He will not give up on you. Our life groups. When I get together with your life group leaders, I encourage them that these are the kinds of relationships that we must have. Not relationships based on convenience on convenience, but based on covenant. Covenant. You see, agape relationship says, your burden is my burden. Millie, your burden is our burden. Alan, is Alan in here? Alan, your burden is our burden. These two people are dealing with the sick illness of cancer. We we will not love you when it's convenient. We will love you because we can. And we should. And that goes for anybody. I don't mean to just single them out. I'm, I'm all of us. Agape love says, I will always be honest with you. Honesty. We will walk in authentic transparency. And and being honest as the body of Christ doesn't mean I'm going to come up here every Sunday morning and confess all my, my sin and tell all of my, you know, throw all my dirty laundry out here. But it does mean that I need a place to do that. It means that there is a place of covenant relationship where I'm able to be honest with someone. Agape relationships say. I love you for who you are and not what you do. See, phileo relationships, you know, those that are, or, and especially eros, eros is another word that's used where we get the term erotic, and it means to be self-absorbed. And so we also, I like the, uh, the illustration that uh, eros is love with a hook. Love with a hook. And you and I have experienced those kinds of relationships in our life, haven't we? Where it seemed all lovey-dovey, but there was a hook in it. And when somebody didn't get what they wanted out of it, because they were, they were trying to hook us in, when they didn't get what they wanted, bam, they're gone. That's love with a hook. Agape says, there's no hook. I love you for who you are, not for what I can get out of you. Amen? Fourthly, agape love says, I give up my right to be right. I give up my right to be right. Sometimes in relationships, it's not a matter of who's right. It's a matter of who's willing to love. Who's willing to love. Lay down our rights and get near each other. Now, and, and in saying that, it's not saying we compromise the truth. That's not not the point here. 
giving up our right to be right, my need to be right over you. And then agape love says, we're all in this together. I'm here for you and you're here for me. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. I love to, well, Cornerstone has, Dave, you can bring the team on up. Cornerstone has been a place of amazing miracles. They had a healing service here not too long ago, and wow, what a powerful night of healing that was. Amen? There were miracles, and there's been miracles of marriages restored here. There's been miracles of friendships restored, you know, relationships. There's been miracles of people being called out and sent out to the mission field. There's been miracles of of people being raised up to plant churches. There's been miracles of of people coming to Christ, salvation. And I want this to be a place of miracles just as much as you are. But without love, it means nothing. Without love. Without love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Without love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Without loving on God. Without loving on each other. Without loving the world around us. Those who are lost. means nothing. Absolutely nothing. So. My invitation to you. And to me this morning. Is let's put on. Our agape love. Let's not give up on each other. Now, you can't force people to respond in a relationship. You know that, right? You can't force them. All you can do is offer agape. So let's put on our agape and offer it to each other. Amen?